You'll notice that there's a rust proof coating on the surface. You want to get that off. Spray a bit of brake clean onto the surface and wipe it off with a clean shop rag. Same on the back. Now to install the rotor onto the hub, you'll notice that you'll have to position the bearing in a certain position in order for it to fall in place. Then you could just lift the rotor up, align the hub bolt holes and install the bolts. Just gonna snug these up for now. I'll torque them to spec later after the pads are installed. And we're ready to install the hub rotor and bearing assembly back onto the knuckle. Whenever handling the rotor, it's best to handle it from the edges. You don't want to get grease on the pad friction surface. Let's spray it down one more time. Installation is pretty self-explanatory. It'll only go in one way because the bolts are offset. So make sure that it's that the bearing is facing the right way. If some bolts go in and others don't, then you have it positioned in the wrong direction. You can do this by hand or with air tools. You want to tighten the fasteners in a crisscross pattern to prevent the bearing from binding. That's done. And you know you're done tightening when the bearing is fully bottomed out in the recess in the knuckle, like this. 
Here's another look on the passenger side. And no, before you ask, I didn't put that bolt there. That was there when I got here. Apparently someone must have sheared off or lost one of these bolts while doing a brake job in the past. I decided to skip over that faster and go from side to side because I really didn't want to have to change my socket out. So the bolts that came with this from the factory are 12 millimeter, but this odd bolt here is 14. For those of you who want to know what the torque specs are for these fasteners, it's 33 foot-pounds, but don't worry about the torque when you're tightening the bolts down to pull the bearing in. After it's pulled in, so it's flush with the knuckle, then you can loosen it up and torque it to spec. Now we can pop the axle and the lower ball joint back in. Feed it into the center of the hub. And rotate the hub until the splines align and it'll pop right in. Then reinstall the lower ball joint stud into the lower control arm. Install the lower ball joint castle nut. Snug that up. For those of you who want to know the torque spec for that castle nut, it's 36 foot-pounds, and then you only tighten it far enough to line it up with the hole in the stud to reinstall the cotter pin. As you can see, I can't put the cotter pin through because the tooth here is in the way. So I'm going to tighten it up a little bit further so I can install the cotter pin. And now you can see we're lined up. This is when it's a good idea to have an assortment of cotter pins handy. This one looks about the right size. Some people choose to reuse them, but I don't because they're so inexpensive it's really not worth it. And oftentimes, as you saw when I removed the cotter pin here, they break and then you have to replace them anyway. So just stick it through, bend one end up this way, Bend the other end up that way. There you go. Here's a question that comes up if you remove both slide pin bolts from the caliper. One thing you'll notice about these slide pins is that one of them is bare on the end and the other one has a piece of rubber at the end. Now if you were to remove the caliper by removing both of these fasteners, how would you know which one goes where? Well, it's pretty simple. On one of the bolts, there's a G and on another, there's an L. And if you look on the caliper, you'll see stamped into it well, it may be a little bit difficult because it's so rusty. There's a G stamped into it here, and an L stamped into it there. So, when installing the slide pins, install the L one on the side stamped L, and the G one on the side stamped G. Before installing the caliper bracket, check the slide pin boots. Make sure they're not warped and don't have any cracks or tears. If these don't Seal the grease in, water gets in there, causes rust, the pads stick, and it destroys your rotors. So make sure that these are in good shape.
Make sure you get the bolts good and snug with a half inch drive ratchet. For those of you who want to know, these two bolts here, the caliper bracket to knuckle bolts, should be torqued to 80 foot-pounds. Now you'll notice on the caliper brackets, there are these stainless steel clips here. It's a good idea to replace these anti-rattle clips whenever you do a major brake service like this. It's also a good idea to take a wire brush and clean up the caliper bracket where the clips attach if the surface is excessively rusty. The brackets here were in good shape. They come in a kit, and the kit does both sides. They're very simple to install. You notice there's a little protrusion here. Just line it up and press it down. Same thing up top. Want to press them down so that the bottom of the clip is flush with the caliper bracket. You'll notice over here that it's not flush. And this is an issue with this aftermarket hardware kit I have. It has additional metal on the end of these clips here. You can see that the original clips don't have that additional piece of metal right here. While the new clips have that additional piece of metal. So it makes them a bit more difficult to install, but it's not too bad. So what you have to do is get a screwdriver under it, pry back to clear this little hump up here on the caliper bracket, and then just push up right here. There it goes. Now you can just push it up, and as you can see, the clip is now flush with the surface of the caliper bracket. Here's another look at installing the brake hardware. You'll notice that when I clip it in, on this side, it's flush with the caliper bracket, but on this side, it's not. Pry up on the clip and press it in. Just like that. Now you'll see it's flush on this side and flush on this side. Same process for the other side. Now we want to put the caliper back onto the caliper bracket before you reinstall the slide pin which we wiped off earlier you want to apply some silicone paste to the pin only use silicone paste don't use any C's Now you can insert the pin into the caliper bracket. Another thing to be aware of, make sure you don't get the hose all twisted up. When you remove the caliper from your bungee cord, make sure this hose isn't twisted.
In order to fit the new pads, you have to compress this piston back into the caliper. As the pads wear, the piston comes further and further out to compensate. So with the new pads and all that friction material on them, I won't be able to swing this caliper back down over the new pads when I install them. Very simple to compress the piston, but one thing that many people don't do is pinch off the brake line and open the bleeder in order to prevent dirty brake fluid from getting forced back into the master cylinder. That can destroy your master cylinder. When that crud gets between the seals, it destroys the seals and you're going to need a new master cylinder. Swing the caliper back down and remove the rubber bleeder cap. And then you want to pinch off the rubber brake line. Don't attempt to pinch off a braided stainless steel brake line or you'll permanently damage it. I have this special tool which pinches it off. If you don't have that, you could get a pair of vice grips. Just wrap the jaws with a few wraps of duct tape to prevent from damaging the line. Then attach your bleeder wrench to the bleeder. There's usually a rubber cap on here. I've already removed it. It's very important to put that rubber cap back when you're done. It prevents dirt and road debris from plugging up the bleeder. Insert the line from your container. Crack open the bleeder. Remove your wrench so you could swing the caliper up. I like to use the bungee cord I used before to hold it in the up position. And now you're ready to compress your piston. Now, there's two ways to compress it with a C-clamp and the way I do it with a large pair of channel locks. Now either way you never directly want to press on the piston. You could damage it. What you want to use is a block of wood or what I like to use, an old brake pad. You want to compress the piston slowly and look for brake fluid to come out of the bleeder. If the piston doesn't compress, either the bleeder isn't fully open or the bleeder is clogged. This is very likely if your bleeder was missing its rubber cap. To clean it, unscrew the bleeder from the caliper and check the large hole your hose connects to and make sure it's clear. If it is, check the other hole on the side. You can clean up the bleeder with a wire brush or wire wheel on a bench grinder. This hole is where the fluid exits when the bleeder is open. After you're done, be sure to pick up some bleeder caps so this doesn't occur again. That's good enough. Now we can swing the caliper back down. Snug up the bleeder. Remove the line. Install the bleeder cap and unpinch the brake line. Here's another look on the other side. First I'm going to pinch off the brake hose. Remove the leader cap. Install the line from your catch bottle. Crack the bleeder loose. Swing the caliper back up.
Then you can swing the caliper back down. Close off the bleeder. Remove the hose. And unpinch the brake line. And always remember to reinstall your bleeder caps. Now I'm going to swing the caliper back up. Use my bungee cord to hold it out of the way. Now before you install the pads, you want to lubricate them at certain points. Make sure to hold the pads from the edges of the backing plates and avoid touching the friction material. Any grease or oil on the pads will cause a reduction in braking performance. If you have any question of where to lubricate your pads, basically anywhere the pads slide. That would include this area here and these two sides here and here. Wherever the pads make contact with the caliper bracket. So to show you that, I'm going to put the pad in. And when you look where it makes contact, you can see it makes contact on the top left and right. Nowhere else does it make metal to metal contact. It also makes contact on the bottom. Bottom, left, and right. Some people like to use silicone and you can do that, but I'm going to use anti-seize. Only use a small amount of copper anti-seize on the backing plate at those slide contact points. Never use it on slide pins. Anti-seize on slide pins will eventually harden and cause the slide pins to stick which will destroy your pads and rotors. So I want to apply just a little bit here, here, and here. Same thing on the bottom, here, here, and here. And do not get this on the friction material. and repeat the process on the other side of the backing plate. A quicker way to apply the anti-seize to both pads is to hold them together with the friction materials facing each other so you can apply it to both pads at once. Push it up against the rotor and that's it. Same process with the inner pads, and one thing I didn't mention earlier, you notice there's a clip here. This is your wear indicator. These pads always go on the inside, right here. Do not put these on the outside, and don't put two of the pads with these, obviously, on the same wheel. You also want the wear indicator facing up. If you install the inner pad and the wear indicator is facing down, swap it out with the other inner pad from the set. You can see in an example here, both pads are oriented in the same direction, but one has the wear indicator facing up and the other down. The wear indicator is a piece of metal that will make contact with your rotor and make a noise when the pads are at the end of their service life. I'm going to apply the same amount of anti-seize onto this pad. And insert it the same way you would on the other side. Now you can swing the caliper down, push it forward on its slide pins and swing it down and over the pads. Press in the boot here. Now if it doesn't want to swing down and it's hitting the brake pads, that happens for one of two reasons. Either the pads aren't fully seated in the caliper bracket here, or the piston hasn't been compressed far enough. Apply some silicone to the slide pin. Reinstall the other slide pin. the caliper, flip seats, and reinstall the fastener. My 
wipe off any excess silicone coming out of the boot. And snug up the bolt. For those of you interested, the caliper bracket mounting bolts should be torqued to 54 foot-pounds. We're pretty much in the home stretch here. Make sure to wipe off any silicone that oozes out of the boots when you install slide pins. That's normal. You don't want that getting on the surface of the rotor. Also, this may happen on occasion. You see how this boot looks a little bloated? Just burp it by pulling it back away from the end of the caliper. Now you can see it looks somewhat normal before it was all bloated. So just basically pull it back, press down on it, and pull back the end of it from the caliper. Believe it or not, that can actually cause the pads to drag since it pulls the outer pad toward the rotor. One thing you want to check is to make sure that all around the end of these boots are sealing flat against the back of the caliper here. If they're not, the grease can get out, moisture can get in, your slide pins will stick, and you can destroy your pads and rotors. So after putting in the bolts, make sure that all around these are seated properly. If they're not, you could get a little pocket screwdriver, get it back there, and unroll the end of the boot so it's sitting properly. Here's our new axle nut. While we can torque down the axle nut here with the tire on and the vehicle on the ground, you can't torque down these hub to rotor nuts here. So I'm going to apply the brake with a piece of wood and we're going to torque these fasteners down. Now you'll remember we compressed the piston into the caliper. You're going to have to pump the brakes a few times in order for that piston to come back out and make contact with the pads. The pedal should feel firm and it does. If the pedal sinks to the floor and feels spongy, that would indicate errors in the system. In that case, you would have to top off the master cylinder and bleed the system at all four wheels following the bleed order in the service manual. Check out my brake bleeding video for details. Now you can torque the hub to rotor bolts. Torque them to 40 foot-pounds in a crisscross pattern. Now the axle nut. It's important to torque this because as you probably already know, it's hard enough to remove manually when it's torqued properly. Forget about how much more difficult it's going to be when someone zips it down with an impact at whatever its max torque is. So make sure to torque this properly. The torque for this fastener is 181 foot-pounds. And that's done. Check it again. Now you just want to stake the shoulder of the nut down in here. The easiest way to do this is with a cold chisel and a hammer. start 
some nuts by hand. I'm just running these down. I'm not tightening them up all the way with an impact. I'll use a torque wrench once the wheel's on the ground. Lower the vehicle until the wheel just touches the ground. That way the wheel can't rotate. And torque the lugs in a crisscross pattern. 80 foot pounds. And we check them all. One more time, because one of them was a little loose. You'll notice there's a picture of a valve stem on the hubcap. That should be pointing towards the valve stem on the wheel. You'll also notice that this picture of a valve stem lines up with this notch here. So point this notch at the valve stem. And after you're done, top off the fluid in the master cylinder. Make sure to reinstall the cap in the right direction. There's an arrow on the cap that should point towards the front of the vehicle. Otherwise, the wires from the brake fluid level sensor will get in the way. Remove your piece of wood propping the pedal, and you're ready for a test drive.